And for those of, our, of you who are still here, really, really thank you. You know, really thank you for staying for my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about knowledge extraction in retail uh, or the Internet of Things applied to the retail store. It's a talk about shopping. Some sociologists claim that we people only care about two things. One is shopping. The other, I won't say because we are being recorded. <laughs> um, but since shopping is, is what's really relevant to the talk, let me, let me emphasize. Uh, shopping is, is uh, procuring objects for, and, and objects define us. The objects we buy nourish our body, uh, keep us from nudity, define, project the image of who we want. Objects we buy change, turn our houses into homes. Uh, objects we buy as presents uh, establish bonds with our families and, and, and relatives. So shopping from a personal point of view is really important. But from an economic point of view, it's extremely important. Shopping, in, in, in macroeconomic ter uh, terms, is called consumer spending, which together with uh, public spending and industrial investment and the housing market are the main drivers of the economy. If, if consumer spending goes down, everybody panics. Okay? So <clears throat> it's important to take a, a, a good look at shopping. And uh, our research is based basically on, on two hypotheses. First. Shopping is a very important industry which is very, very far from efficient. There's a great deal of productivity we, we can still squeeze out of the shopping uh, process. And the second, it, there is a great deal of knowledge completely untapped in the shopping. At least in brick and mortar shopping, in online shopping, which is a model for us, there's a, 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 a great industry um, dedicated to applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to analyze every click, what's called click stream analysis of, um, of what happens in online shopping. But all of that, up to now, it's completely untapped, uh, uh, underutilized in <coughs> uh, traditional shopping. But first, uh, why does all this have to do with the Internet of Things? Well, very quickly, you know, the Internet was originally uh, designed to put computers in communication with each other. Very quickly, it became a phenomenal success at connecting people with each other and people with, with computers. And that's the Internet um, we know and love and use uh, right now. Well, the Internet of Things is about a third player in this game, which are objects, things. Um, most of the IoT, Internet of Things, we know are smart cities, smart farms, which are basically sensorizing objects and, and, and capturing this data into information systems. Well, what we are interested here is uh, in a different kind of relationship is between the interaction between objects and people, which is a, a less studied uh, relationship that emerges from the Internet of Things. And uh, when we talk about Internet of Things, a lot of people think about smart refrigerators and cars and this. Well, we, are, we have chosen the most difficult problem, which is the problem of uh, interaction with people and simple objects. Uh, clothes, books, things we buy in the retail store. And we do have a few technologies, uh, the most important being uh, RFID, that allows us to uh, detect a lot of these, these interactions and capture this data for further analysis. Well, the two hypotheses were that shopping is uh, far from uh, an efficient process. It's actually <clears throat> like a hurdle race. Well, we start by being called potential thieves as we enter the store. You know, there are some gates there that say, we're watching you, we're watching you, okay? And uh, <clears throat> then we see lines. Many times we don't even enter the store because of the lines. It's very complicated to find things in a store. It's very hard sometimes. And, and, um, <clears throat> and then when we find finally the shelf where the product should be, more, very often, more often than we would like, the 
size of the color we wanted is not there, you know, which is extremely frustrating. If we need to try something on, it's also extremely frustrating. We go there, it's the wrong size, we have to undress, redress, hunt for the size we wanted, go back. It's really, you know, a miracle we end up shopping at all, you know. <clears throat> and finally, lines, you know. After all that, lines. And after all the design of the product, the marketing of the product, the, the having the store, having done everything, it turns out 30% of the people abandon the shop with the product already selected and ready to pay after five minutes wait. No, no wonder online shopping is such, such a success because all these problems don't exist. They don't call you a thief. There are no stockouts. Everything is available. You have plenty of information. There are no lines. Of course, it has some drawbacks. Of course, it has some drawbacks because you cannot feel the, the, the object, you have, uh, the product, you have to wait um, a few days, less and less anymore, but you have to wait to have your, there is no immediate satisfaction of your shopping needs, but still, you know, the, 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 the fact that uh, shopping online is so much more convenient is making online shopping grow in double digits while traditional shopping, what's called brick and mortar shopping, is declining, in fact. <coughs> But first I, I, hypothesis I, I remind you was, it's a very inefficient process, shopping in a store, but also there is a lot of opportunities. And the technology behind uh, online shopping is amazing. We don't know as users, but they are analyzing every single click we're taking there, you know. Uh, um, machine learning algorithms have progressed tremendously. They had to be adapted because uh, they, they uh, were not satisfied with the statistical learning from, from shopper behavior. They want to take actions immediately. They are analyzing your click stream and making decisions on exactly what your next screen is going to look like to maximize the probability of you um, <clears throat> actually buying something, what's called conversion ratios. Conversion ratios are, are the uh, ratios of of the different uh, steps from landing in the landing page of the store until um, checking out in the uh, shopping basket. Well, for instance, recommendations. Recommendations, we've heard a lot of talks here about recommendations. Well, in shopping, recommendations is extremely, extremely important. 70% uh, of Amazon's homepage is devoted to recommendations because 35% of their sales are uh, originated in recommendations. That means that the jump in sales is plus 50%. Amazon sells 50% more thanks to uh, recommendations. Well, you go to a retail store and none of that is there. No recommendations, no convenience. Why? Well, not because there are no technologies that could do that. This is pretty much a greenfield, a blue ocean of opportunity for us to, if we can, generate something equivalent to the click stream in the retail store, to take all that wealth of knowledge and analysis into the physical retail store and save a lot of uh, businesses and save a lot of jobs um, in the process. Well, one way to analyze that is not to antagonize online and, and offline retail models, but to start thinking about a single model. Well, brick and mortar model uh, uh, retail is about putting shoppers and products in contact through a physical space. Online commerce is basically doing the same thing, but in a virtual space. For several years, they've lived completely separate lives. But more and more, through something that's um, known by the buzzword of omni-channel, more and more these two things are convergent. And uh, the vision of our research group is there will be a platform that will <clears throat> get inputs of all kinds um, and produce outputs of all kinds to create a mixed media or a mixed uh, uh, platform shopping experience. We'll be able to 
uh, shop online, get the stuff in the store, or the opposite, shop in the store, do part of our shopping there, and then create an online order from the store that shipped to our home, you know, uh, just start our shopping in, the, in our phones and end in the store, all, all, all possibilities. But in order for these two worlds to merge, the customers we should find in the real store something similar to what we find in the online uh, commerce platform. And this is basically a lot of interactivity. Online shopping is really interactive, while uh, traditional shopper is, is far from interactive. We should uh, have a personalized shopping experience, uh, which online it's getting more and more personalized. And um, in traditional shops, it's completely anonymous and also contextualized. Everything that happens should be about what we're interested in. Okay? So these are the different technologies that create this interactivity, personalization, and contextualization of shopping. <clears throat> RFID is a technology, chip technology, that by adding a five cent antenna and chip to the label of the products, or to the products themselves, allows the product to make its presence known in any space. That's simple. Okay? A shirt, a book, a pair of shoes, anything can make its presence knows, known in a space. And that uh, announcement of the present triggers events that until now did not happen. You know? So we don't need a very uh, complicated technology. All we need is you know, a certain item to make its presence knows, known. Uh, RFID <coughs> is a technology that identifies every item, not every reference, not every class of products, but every specific object. So we can track the life cycle of that product, from manufacturing to uh, <coughs> stocking in the store, buying, maybe returns, <coughs> the whole thing. So we're talking about life cycle. We're somehow giving the concept of life to objects. Okay? This, we're making objects active. The real goal, what we really wish we could do, and we're only starting to, uh, to accomplish the technology, is we would like to click in the store. We go to a screen online, we click, and we find information. We click, we find opinions. We click, and we find recommendations. Well, we touch the shelf, and no matter how much, we, nothing happens, right? Nothing happens. Well, we have not completely solved that problem yet. We've only started, you know, some uh, only half satisfactory uh, solutions to it. But uh, although we don't have a solution, we have a name for this. We have coined the portmanteau term "crick." You know, "crick" is a combination of brick and mortar clicks. Okay, so "crick" is the abstract term of being able to uh, point to an object and create events, interactive, contextualized, and personalized events about this object. Some of our early uh, attempts have been using uh, augmented reality and RFID. Um, if we put RFID antennas and RFID labels on the objects, the shelves know what objects are more or less where, with a, with a precision of 25 centimeters. Okay? So if we point an augmented reality software to the shelf, we can map the screen coordinates to the shelf coordinates, ask the shelf uh, what contents uh, are in that particular position, uh, and then find information about this product pro uh, and, and create whatever interactive experience is, um, is called for in that particular instant. Well, <clears throat> that pretty much works. Uh, it has its limitations, but as always, you know, limitations are not so important if you really need it. Who really needs that? Well, people with physical mobility limitations. If you are in a wheelchair, you cannot browse a shelf. You can go to a store, you know, wheelchairs can do pretty much everything. They can drive, they can take the bus, they can access any building, but it, shocking as it may be, they cannot shop independently because anything that's outside arms reach, they cannot, um, 
they cannot browse, they cannot find information, so they need somebody to go with them with the um, consequent uh, lack of privacy. And this is a product that after certain surveys of people with uh, uh, mobility limitations, you know, they have said, yeah, I, I would like to go by myself, not with somebody next to me, you know, that's watching over my shoulder what I, I am doing at every moment. So either with a handheld or even a lot of people with, with uh, bound to a wheelchair have also serious arm mobility problems. So with Google Glasses and we've been able to fix the gaze of, uh, of these people in a certain position on the shelf and give them information. That doesn't completely solve the problem because at the end if they are interested in something they need help to get it. But at least the browsing part of shopping they can do by themselves. Okay? And, and the obvious question is, why don't online? Well, they do, they do all the time, but if you talk to them, they say, yeah, but I want to go to the store like everybody else, and they have the right, and it's understandable. Well, um, now, um, after once um, we've uh, learned and we keep working on, on this, uh, better and more efficient and, and more usable implementations of cricking. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of uh, different uh, uh, strategies we're following to capture extraction. We are in the phase, uh, uh, to, sorry, to capture information, to uh, extract knowledge from the store. We are in the phase of solving the problem of capturing the data. Eventually, when we have all the data available, then we'll worry about what, what to do with it. But that'll be a simple problem in the sense that online commerce is already working on that problem. So our, our idea is to provide from physical shopping in the physical store the same or similar levels of information that we have from clickstream analysis. And then machine learning algorithms, recommendation algorithms, all these things can be run on this data. But extracting data from clickstream from a mouse click on a, is a completely different problem than extracting data from people shopping in the store. And there is a lot of hardware and a lot of software that needs to be developed in order to obtain that information. <coughs> well, they, they have to be a lot of solutions for coding. You know, it's very important that, uh, that the right number is given to every tag. But the first problem is knowing where things are. That, may seem like uh, uh, something that's not necessary. Don't stores know what they have and where it is? Well, they don't. Or if they do, they know at best with 80% accuracy, which is far from what they need, okay? Um, if if uh, Decathlon wants to compete with Amazon, they are going to be sourcing online orders from the stores, so 80% is not sufficient. They need 99.9% .9 accuracy in, in, in the information of what they have, and they need to know where to get it. You know? um, <clears throat> this is why, for instance, Decathlon, Inditex, Macy's, Marks & Spencer, Tesco, all the big retailers are already RFID tags in all their objects. Um, we have several solutions, but one solution that is uh, actually um, relevant to the Maria demands to context because it's a, a solution that will require cooperation with other groups in uh, the department is the idea of a robot that will go around the store capturing information about inventory and location. The question is what products are where? Okay. This is like the basic information we need for anything else to happen. And, and the fact is that this is far, far from solved right now. You can go around with a handheld either with a little antenna and electronics detecting the tax, but if you're in a huge department store, that's a task that uh, goes beyond the capabilities of humans. You know, they get lost, you know, so we can send a robot. Right now we have certain limitations with a robot. We need to provide the robot with a map, once we have a map, we need to tell the robot more or less what path to follow. Uh, of course, we would much prefer a robot to be left in an unknown space 
and the robot first to explore the space to create a map and second to plan its own path along the map. So we're talking about exploration, planning, all things that if you've been today in these talks, you know, ring, ring a bell. Okay, so making um, the, the state of the art in robotics for inventory, it's, uh, there are only two or three companies in the world that can do that. One is here, we're collaborating with them. Uh, but the state of the art is that the robot cannot plan. So we are trying to um, push that state of the art beyond its current limits. Okay, then we have the, the smart shells. We've already talked about that. Um, the smart shells, of course, provide inventory. We are also the the <coughs> we are also applying machine learning technique to detect when a customer interacts with an object. Okay, the augmented reality creaking uh, technique works, but it requires uh, an in, a, a technology in between. The the ideal would be we take a book from the shelf and immediately something happens. Well, it turns out it's a difficult problem because RFID to read that. The, the shelf continues to be uh, identifying that book, but there are changes, subtle changes in the power and phase parameters of the RFID detection that can be inferred as being a interaction with that. And we have done, uh, we have applied, you know, the classics, support vector machines and, 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 and regression and different, different techniques and have uh, obtained good enough results, at least good enough to publish, you know, good enough to publish. Um, so I think we are pushing, we are in the state of the art of interaction detection using RFID. <coughs> Shelves also displays. I, would, I could get into the importance of displays. Displays are more for brands, they, and they are, they are business changing, but um, <coughs> let me continue. Then uh, there are other interesting cases, like for instance the fitting room, no? a, a place where the um, presence of a certain object can trigger an interactive contextualized experience is a fitting room. So, and there are uh, systems already developed which when a customer enters a fitting room, the products that she or he is wearing appear on the screen. The first reaction is, what a coincidence, you know? The, the marketing content is exactly what I have, you know? And then maybe the second time or the third time, they will think, well, maybe it's not a coincidence. Well, it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. This is another way of click creaking, you know? The mere presence of a garment inside a fitting room creaks an event to happen. You know? And here we have an opportunity of showing opinions, showing recommendations, showing. And, but the key here is not to expect the customer to do anything. A lot of people say, why don't you have a barcode reader and you read the barcode? Then you require a very small intervention by the consumer, which means that 99% of the time it won't happen. We are lazy. People are lazy. Huh? So it has to be completely, completely autom automatic. And RFID allows that. Well, we want to determine things like an object leaving the store or entering the store. Well, it turns out these, these problems seem are easy uh, and, and look easy, but turn out to be extremely difficult. You require to, to determine, which is a problem that's currently uh, we are currently working on, to determine whether a product enters or leaves the store, you require a combination of phased array antennas and mm, certain algorithms. We're trying machine learning, we're trying more simple algorithms, but it's very hard with a high reliability distinguish between an object that's leaving the store, entering the store, or just sitting next to the door. You know, these three, you know, because even a 1% uh, false positive means that the mannequins next to the door are going to be creating false events all the time. So we're going to need parts per million error in that detection if we want that to be useful at all. And getting to 90% is easy, fairly easy, 
you know, getting to almost ac very, very accurate uh, results is very, very challenging. <clears throat> well, also the payment is very important, you know, because at the end, you know, what does online? At the end, online measures through clickstream all the conversion ratios, and conversion ratios are finally in the denominator have how many of these initial shopping processes ended up in a sale. So if we at the payment point, we detect, let me just show you a video, it's not very, that from a technology point of view, it's, this is not very important or very interesting, but from a data analysis point of view, it's crucial to detect the, the, when the item leaves. So right now, <coughs> we are able to sit with the big retailers, with Inditect and with Decathlon and say, okay, we have the technology that allows you to know that particular product that went, uh, that, that checked out at a certain time, did it go through the fitting room or not? In exactly what shelf was it sitting? So we can measure the productivity of every single fixture or part of the store. We can assign a euro value in sales per hour for every shelf. And you can understand this is immensely valuable to shoppers. We can also tell them, you know, if they're uh, we can calculate conversion ratios of fitting rooms. They have no idea now. They have the fitting rooms because they have to have them, but they don't know how many sales. If, if fitting rooms are increasing the uh, conversion ratio, maybe they need to put twice as many, or maybe they need to close half of them. They have no idea now because they're not measuring anything. So see how a simple technology can extract so much information you know, some of it might be easier to analyze. Some of it is much more difficult to analyze and requires much more complicated algorithms. Uh, um, also, after, you know, payment, checking what happens in the door is important, too. Uh, we are more um, interested in our research in detecting objects coming in and out. There's a a a a an entire industry dedicated to uh, analyzing people coming in and out, which turns out to be also a surprisingly difficult problem, you know, because the light of day, the shadows, the lighting, you know, counting how many people, you know, what's called footfall, counting how many people enter the store should be an easy problem. Well, it's not. Apparently it's not. I'm not an expert in it, but people that know about it tell me it's complicated. <coughs> Oops. There's no more slides, I guess. <laughs> well, there are more, but um, it's late, so uh, let me uh, let me conclude. Let me conclude. The idea of our uh, research, basically, it's it's an ambitious it's an ambitious goal we have. It's an ambitious goal we have, and not a lot of research groups are tackling this this problem. It's basically. Uh, developing the systems made of hardware and software algorithms that will extract the data sets from consumer activity in the retail store that will allow an analysis of the same level of uh, effectiveness and business impact as uh, is available to online stores. Okay, And that starts in knowing what we have and where we have it in the stores. And just, just to illustrate how these apparently sy uh, simple systems uh, uh, problems are actually hard to uh, solve, is just to know what products and where they are in a store, we need to develop a robot that explores, that plans, that applies sophisticated algorithms to from the antenna readings uh, hone in into the position of the objects, you know, or um, <clears throat> another simple uh, object, and another simple um, data set is interactions that happen in a shelf, you know. We, ne we need to apply machine learning algorithms to the different uh, features of the RFID parameters, such as power, uh, read counts, phase, you know, in order to decide whether it's just random fluctuations or it's actually an interaction and happening, you know? Uh, because even 
you know, we have the product sitting there all day, you know, even a small percentage, very small percentage of false positive is going to be creating false events all day, you know, all day. So it's the, the problem is complicated because of the level of precision, you know, F factor of 0 0.8, that's not nearly, you know, that gets you a paper, a paper published, in fact it did for us, but it's not nearly uh, good enough for actual use in an actual retail store. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. that work in the shops in this technology because that's something distinct to, to online shops where, where there's no human being present. In well, which way can they be integrated in, in this? Well, first, the change in the role of humans in the shopping is part of the reason why we're doing that. It used to be people in, working in stores were knowledgeable, had been working there for a long time and were actually helpful. Well, that is part of the past. That, they are just, most of the time, people working on the store are just human mannequins. They are just hired to wear clothes and to be part of the decoration. It's, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there's a part of truth in that, yeah? Exactly. So, but these people, you know, they need some truth. So all these tools, you know, they can be targeted to the customer but it turns out that in many cases, they are targeted as tools to help what they, uh, they uh, these people are called associates in the retail lingo, okay? To help associates do their job better without a need for training or long-term experience, okay? For instance, if, um, <clears throat> just give, give you an example. Certain customer enters a fitting room, okay? And that person is going with a certain garment. Then that event triggers an order to one of the associates to say, okay, this person would probably like to try out so this other, you know, the associate goes find it, takes it to the fitting room, you know, and it turns out that person ends up buying that, you know. The customer is happy, the associate is happy because their uh, variable pay increased, their commission increased, the retailer is happy, the brand is happy. It's a win all around situation, okay. So it's uh, it's, all, it's a little bit like creating cyber associates, you know, associates that are not very smart or very experienced or very good at what they're doing, but they have the technology that tells them exactly what to do, when to do it, and where to do it, you know. So all they need to do is execute that, and they create more sales, and they do their job better, you know, and that's actually happening. Yeah. Not so precise. Well, the te RFID technology is so good that it's almost magic. That's a, that's, that's a reaction people have when they see it working. Wow. You know? And there was a time, long time ago, when RFID, we were worried about not detecting enough. Now the problem is exactly the opposite. Our problem with RFID technology, it reads too much. Too much. It's too good. So we need to uh, do, uh, write a lot of software code, you know, to tell, you know, from the interesting reads to the stray reads, as we call them, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, techniques, you know, for the, the, an antenna overhead, a fitting room, it's also going to be reading from the other, you know. So we need to compare the reads from the different antennas, apply algorithms and filter and make decisions, you know, decision making based on... Uh, on, okay, this product cannot be in two fitting rooms at the same, so which is the most likely, we use probabilistic uh, algorithms to decide in which fitting room it's actually. So the problem we have is RFID technology being too good and about price is incredibly cheap, you know. This, you have a, a tag that costs five cents 
and it has a, a radio frequency transceiver in it, you know, that can run four sessions at the same time, can be talking to four different readers at the same time. It's, to me, it's mind blowing. You can do that for five cents. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh,